Hey everyone, Danielle Kessner here bringing you another episode of Paved with Good Intentions. Yes, I am back. I know it's been a while, um, and actually I will get into why I've been absent from this podcast for so long, but I am officially back. So, um, yay! Very excited. Um, I do want to forewarn you, though, this episode of the podcast, basically, on YouTube, is going to be an audio-only podcast. I'm doing this video intro just to kind of you know, square things away, let you guys kind of know what's going on. But yes, it is an audio only podcast. I've been doing a lot of um, different things with, you know, my setup and how I'm doing things. So I'm not quite to the point where I can do a video podcast version of it. So unfortunately, this is going to be all audio. But as a bonus, just sort of as a, you know, welcome back, I am doing the full episode on YouTube. So the episode that I normally do just on iTunes and Stitcher, I'm going to do the full episode right here on YouTube, the whole audio. So it's going to have both the main story as well as the supplemental material that I normally just put on the audio podcast. So everyone's a winner today. Um, and in that second section, I will discuss where I've been for so long. But thanks again for watching Pay With Good Intentions, and I hope you enjoy the episode. When I say paved, you say with good intentions. Paved. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Paved With Good Intentions, the show that asks the difficult questions you didn't even think you cared about. I'm Danielle Kessner, and this podcast is produced sponsor-free, so thank you for supporting independent artists. It's been a while, I know, but here I am back, hopefully doing podcasts a little bit more regularly, and I will get into why I was gone in the second part of the episode in the introspective. But first, today we're going to be talking about a subject that has come up somewhat recently in a big way, but has obviously been around for quite some time. And whether people stress the importance of it or not is up to them, but I feel like it's something that needs to be discussed, it needs to be said, and what I'm talking about is sexism in Hollywood. So two weekends ago, Ghostbusters was released, and the movie came out to moderate reviews and modest returns. Honestly, it's an average movie, but it's still a very funny movie. I enjoyed it very much both times I saw it. Now Ghostbusters has the unique honor of being one of the most hated movies before it was ever even released. On YouTube it has some of the most dislikes of any trailer ever, which is quite a feat given that the movie is a comedy and harkens back to childhood for many of us. And much of the antagonism that's been you know, brought this movie's way is because it's a remake of said beloved movie, Ghostbusters. But more aptly, the main characters are all women, which makes this remake somewhat unique from its original predecessor. Now, the knee-jerk reaction to this is that the vitriol that's being spewed for this movie is in fact sexism, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. Even if it's just a knee-jerk reaction, that certainly doesn't mean that it's wrong. Criticism of the movie is fine, but focusing on the fact it's a remake with women in the leads is where it becomes a problem. Now, there's a fair amount of both arguments that the movie is bad for one reason or another, but then people who are saying the movie should be boycotted and bad because they took four male characters and replaced them with four female characters. Now, when you look at the movie itself, Ghostbusters is not exactly unique as a remake in terms of content. Both movies have a similar base story, a team-building type of story, scientists chasing ghosts in New York City. Both films have the same crop of actors, namely SNL alums, and both of them have the same purpose. They're both meant to be silly comedies. They're not intended to be anything grand or anything different than just good comedy, SNL-style comedy. And the only real difference between these movies, aside from the generation of the comedy, is the fact that the main characters are female. Now this movie is somewhat of a milestone because it's one of the most prominent of its kind, if not the first female team major blockbuster, at least of this size. We've had other female-driven blockbusters before, but this is certainly one of the most iconic that they've given us. So it's certainly a milestone given that source material. And not only does it you know, present that material really well, it shatters the Bechdel test. And if you're not familiar with the Bechdel test, it's a three 
test rule to basically say, does the film have more than two named female characters? Do they talk to each other at any given point in the movie? And do they talk to each other about something other than men or really about a man, basically? So now the point, this point that the movie is obviously very strongly female, that point is not lost on many of the reviewers, particularly the non-professional reviewers. Now, there's been a trend over the past few years to have more prominent female characters in big budget movies. And some of them are not only prominent, but even the focal point of the story. Let's look back at Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens. You could argue that the main character of that film is actually Rey, the girl who's picked up on Jakku. So even though she interacts with Poe and Finn and Han Solo and all that, the focal point of the story is Rey and her journey through this. Now in that movie there are some clever paradigm shifts that you really have to be looking for when Finn and Rey are running through the, you know, basically being chased by the stormtroopers and she keeps telling him, you know, to let go of, you know, her hand. And then there's an explosion, they're both on the ground and it's Rey who hands who holds out her hand to Finn to lift him up. Or one that really stuck out to me was when they're in the cantina Finn and Rey are having a conversation, and Rey is on a step and looking down at Finn. Now that dynamic is typically where a man is looking down at the woman, but in this case, the woman, the female character, is looking down at the man. So The Force Awakens certainly had quite an important paradigm shift in terms of the female characters. Then, of course, there was Mad Max Fury Road, which was not only an awesome movie, but the main character of the story was not even the titular character. It was Furiosa. She was the hero of the story. She was the focal point. And Mad Max was really just there to support her and help her on her hero's journey. And this movie sparked a men's right reaction. Now, Force Awakens had its own problems when it cast John Boyega as basically the main, the male lead. But in this case, Mad Max Fury Road, the men's rights movement decided to you know, throw out a boycott for this movie because... They said it was veiled feminist propaganda. Now more of this is coming in the future with comic book movies particularly. We have solo movies coming for Wonder Woman, Captain Marvel, Harley Quinn, and more. And so even though some of these fall into their typical tropes of you know female characters portrayed a certain way, namely there's already been backlash against Harley Quinn's costume in Suicide Squad. So the question is going to be what is her solo movie going to be like? And then there's Black Widow, a character we've seen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe for quite some time, ever since Iron Man 2. And she hasn't had her own film. But ever since there's been a, a great amount of backlash for Black Widow not getting her own film, they are strongly considering actually giving her one. Um, which shows that the response to the backlash has actually worked. Not to mention all the other problems that Marvel and Disney, for that matter, with the Star Wars, of not portraying their female characters prominently despite the fact they are the one of the main characters in those movies. And that goes to show that the ambition for female-led movies is seldom automatic. That you know, Black Widow is a great example of that because you would think a character that they've been building up for so long that she would get her chance to shine right alongside Thor, who's had two underwhelming movies, The Incredible Hulk, Iron Man, Captain America, She's basically in that top five of the Avengers, and yet it's taken more of a fan reaction and anger in order for them to even consider a Black Widow movie, at least publicly. And it might not even get made, despite her contributions to the MCU. Captain Marvel will be the first Marvel character to get her own solo film, and this will be the first time we see Captain Marvel, allegedly at least. Now this trend of having female-centric characters in film has inevitably been, ta been attacked as an agenda. So I'm not saying this to point out that all men feel this way. In fact, not all men feel this way. There's a very small subset of vocal people who believe that female empowerment is somewhat threatening. Or in this case, it's simply female visibility. So even though movies like Wonder Woman and Captain Marvel might show us a badass female character, more importantly, it's about visibility and women getting an opportunity. But some men 
small subset again, are clearly worried about seeing their dominance challenge. Equality is seen as a loss of rights. So they're saying men's rights is, be, you know, is a response to women's equality because equality is seen as a loss of rights. When in reality, all it is is a reduction of privilege, which I don't think any of us would argue is a bad thing. So you have men's rights activists, websites like The Return of Kings, who call for boycotts like movies of movies like Mad Max and Ghostbusters, claiming them to be feminist propaganda, liberal propaganda, using terms like feminazi, pretty much anything, simply because the focal point are females. Now, what's interesting about this is that it suggests that the ownership of ideas or properties belongs to the public. That in order for the public to embrace something like Ghostbusters, we have to, the public has to allow it to happen. Making any alterations are unwelcome without their permission. So the Ghostbusters movie that we got is somewhat of a, you know, it's a crime because we didn't give permission to have a female-led Ghostbusters movie. Personally, I think it was a great idea. But because people say, well, the original Ghostbusters was four men, so if you're going to remake it, it has to be with four men. That suggests ownership of an idea. But they don't own this idea. None of us own this idea. The studio owns the idea. And if the studio wants to go forth with this kind of movie, that's absolutely within their right. And Paul Feig has spoken out as to why he chose to go down this path. And honestly, I think he succeeded. These are just public concepts, and thus they're open to individual interpretations. And personally, I think Paul Feig did a great job with his interpretation of the story. It's still cheesy, it's still stupid, but it's a lot of fun. Regardless of who's in those main character roles. In this case, the four female leads, I thought, did a fantastic job. But also, calling it agenda is somewhat of a short-sighted viewpoint. Because everyone has an agenda. Obviously, calling something agenda an agenda is citing their own agenda. And the word is used negatively simply when someone doesn't agree with a particular interpretation. They say, well, this is their, this is how they present it, so that's them portraying their agenda. They want things to remain static, or in, their, in the case of sites like Return of Kings, these men's rights activists, they basically want things to remain male-driven, which is equally as an agenda as putting females in the forefront. So here's why it matters, and here's why I'm talking about it, and why it's something I actually do care about. It shouldn't matter who's in the lead. It shouldn't matter who is the number one character in a movie or a story. It's about what that story, what whoever is telling that story, it's how they want to tell it. So having women in lead roles like this is certainly an important move, especially given some very key realities. Women make up about half of the population. So obviously a movie that is strictly male driven might not appeal to half of the population. Likewise, a movie that is strictly female-driven might not appeal to the other half of the population. But there's a big difference between a lack of males and a lack of females, because the lack of females in film is something that's actually a serious problem. I'll bet if I asked people to name five female directors, most of them probably couldn't name five. In fact, directors in Hollywood Females are outnumbered 12 to 1 compared to male directors in terms of opportunities. So that is a clear disparity in the opportunities, especially for black women. Not only directors, writers, producers, and actresses, particularly black women, have a real struggle getting their foot in the door and getting opportunities to prove themselves in this industry. Since the beginning, Hollywood has been a male-dominated industry. A lot of the best choice roles, best parts, go to males because they're the ones who typically are selling the tickets and because the ones who are behind the scenes are the men. Even in this Ghostbusters movie, despite the strong female presence, Chris Hemsworth gets a number of choice lines in the movie. He's given a lot of the comic relief in the movie, which obviously you could say well as long as he's you know everybody else gets an opportunity but a lot of people might look at chris hemsworth and say he's the reason that that movie is funny which would obviously undermine the work that the actresses did in this movie 
There's also a still a clear pay gap for women in Hollywood. Notable actresses, including Oscar winner Jennifer Lawrence, have been paid less for their work than their male peers, even if they get the same amount of screen time or pr provide the same amount of effort to a project. And what's happened with the fact that the industry has been this way is that it almost conditioned us to believe that what we've always been given is all that they can give us. That's how it's been in the past, is all the great movies. If you pull, if you pull out the list of the top 100 movies, most of them are going to be male-centric movies. Because, in a sense, female-centric movies challenge that history of Hollywood. You're going to talk about movies like The Shawshank Redemption, or The Godfather, or 2001, or all these other movies. So many of them are male-centric, but that's because those were the opportunities that were given. How many women in those years weren't given opportunities to prove themselves? We only had male personalities, so there's no way to judge male versus female when you have movies on an equal plane. It's never been that you don't have a clear pool of information to pull from when you have male versus female driven movies. Most of them have been male driven because that's just the way history, Hollywood's history has been. And so when people say, well, it seems like they're just focusing too much on women's movie, on, you know, on women in movies, the fact is that this is just a blip on the radar. This is just a small amount of data against a crushing amount of data that shows the opposite has been true ever since Hollywood began. And despite the challenges that female-led films have had, they've actually also been very successful. Movies that are catered more toward women or that have strong female roles are often very successful. Even Ghostbusters, despite what people were saying, it still ended up with $45 million in its opening weekend, which they have to be happy about because it could have been a lot worse. And the scores coming out of it, a lot of people enjoyed it. A lot of people did have fun with it. Also, a lot of people didn't, but that's also personal criticism. On a larger scale, this is not just a Hollywood problem. This is a societal problem in the U.S. Like, just as an example, we are on the cusp of potentially having our first female president, which to us seems like this big milestone, this big, you know, hooray for us moment. But what we fail to realize is that women have, have held high positions in other countries for years. Like, we are one of the, <laughs> we are lagging so far behind in terms of other countries, both developed and underdeveloped countries, that it's somewhat embarrassing to, to say that, well, we might finally have our first female president. Whereas her opponent is one of the most apparent promoters of male dominance, especially as an example, referring to a journalist, Megyn Kelly, who simply was challenging him as a journalist is supposed to do, referring to her as a bimbo. That is a pretty clear indication of what he thinks of a woman of any kind of in any kind of position of power. In the US we have the issue the trans bathroom issue, which is often cited as it's for the protection of women, which is a sentiment that is sexist to begin with because it suggests that women A cannot protect themselves and B require men to be the one to protect them, when in fact women are more than capable of protecting themselves and they can also help each other. It's not simply men trying to protect women. So the whole trans bathroom issue has just highlighted even another subset of sexism that exists in our culture. And then of course, there's the call for women to remain in traditional gender roles. A lot of times these come with religious justifications for female submission. One famous Christian sect, if you can call them Christian in the United States, is the Quiverfell movement, which suggests that women should always be pregnant, which is basically a suggestion that women should always be filling a role for their husbands, for men, essentially, which is essentially, one, ridiculous for a woman to always be pregnant and just continue having babies in a world that's already somewhat overpopulated, but also the fact that if a woman chooses not to have a child, that's also her choice. And as a future-focused country, we spend way too much time mired in the past, thinking about how oh, things used to be great, just Donald Trump's slogan alone, let's make America great again, 
that has an absolutely ridiculous connotation when you think about, well, when was America great, really? In reality, one, one of the reasons that we continue to strive for that is because there is this illusion of greatness in the past, that the past was this fantastical, fantastical time where everybody was prosperous, everybody was happy, but the reality was, unless you were female, or unless you were black, or Asian, or Mexican, if you were any kind, anything other than a white Christian male, more than likely your opportunities were not so great. And as a country that's so future focused, we tend to look at the past with this, you know, rose colored glasses instead of looking at it for what it really was, which was a lot of bad opportunities. Hollywood has a tendency to drive a lot of culture. Whether we want to believe that or not, it really does. The movement is certainly shifting toward more inclusive attitudes, which include race, gender, sexual orientation. In fact, in Marvel Comics, the new Iron Man is a black woman, which is pretty awesome. And of course, this is being met with severe resistance. It's, again, decried as an agenda. And this would make sense if there were ownership involved, but again, these are publicly consumed properties. So if somebody wants to have Iron Man as a black woman, they are more than welcome to have Iron Man as a black woman, and there's nothing stopping them from doing it. The criticism and the response is going to show multiple things about how people are consuming media. And if they're consuming media expecting only to see what they want, or only what is normal to them, then, of course, these things are going to be met with severe resistance. But those who have an open mind, who look at, this is his progress, basically, this is art, this is interpretation, when they look at these things, they can say, I don't like this because it is objectively bad, not because they changed fundamental elements. Or they can say, I love this because it is trying new things, and as a future-focused country, we should always be intent on trying new things. Ghostbusters is a major step forward regardless of how it's received because what it says is that women should have the same opportunities as men for major film roles, especially in a movie about scientists and ghosts and extremely silly comedy, which is exactly what Ghostbusters is. Women should have those same opportunities as men to do that, which is what Ghostbusters showed. And even though this movie did not do so well, time will obviously tell, it's a ripple. And in the end, money talks, but it will plant the seed. There might not be another Ghostbusters, but there will be another movie like Ghostbusters coming out. And with all these other spate of movies coming out, such as Wonder Woman, Harley Quinn, Captain Marvel, with a number of movies coming out that might challenge these old-fashioned ideals, that seed is going to get planted deep. Men's rights activists are going to continue to fight for female suppression. They are going to continue. And like I said, they are a small subset. Most men will go to a movie like Ghostbusters just for the sheer enjoyment of it. But some are going to continue to fight for the suppression of females because that's not the history that they remember. But more opportunities for female artists are coming. And they're working twice as hard to gain those roles and to gain that audience's acceptance. One day, Hopefully it won't matter what the gender or race of the main characters are. They will be judged strictly on their merit and their ability the way it should be. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm going to be talking in this introspection section about why I've been gone for so long. And what I'm going to be talking about is inspiration and motivation. So I'm sure the few of you who actually do listen to this podcast have been wondering where I've been, as both this podcast as well as my translation podcast have been absent since about February of this year. Now, I have been doing a lot of other things. I have been building my YouTube channel, working on writing, getting more books published, basically doing a lot of stuff outside of the podcast. And the reason that I wasn't jumping at 
the opportunity to come back to the podcast was really a matter of inspiration. Because for a while there, I was having some trouble finding mine. And this isn't about depression. It's not about sadness. If anything, it's a bit of, you know, a feeling of being overwhelmed. Uh, Overwhelmed by the current state of the world, by the media, by so much of everything that we're seeing on a daily basis that just is... It just is painful to watch, in a sense. And honestly, I've been emotionally drained, in a sense. And again, it's not necessarily depression, but just to a point where I don't really want to focus on it. I don't want to deal with it. And the reality is, is without motivation, without inspiration, motivation isn't there either. So if I'm not inspired by something, I'm certainly not going to be motivated to pursue something else. And that is more or less why I haven't been here. Maintaining motivation is hard, but rediscovering it is almost more difficult. It's this concept of stagnation versus reinvention. So the way I look at it was back in, you know, December, January of this year, I was starting to feel like I had stagnated. The episodes that I was coming out with, as few as they were at the time, were just sort of, eh, whatever I can come up with, this is what I need to do. So it did feel kind of stagnant. And especially on my translation podcast, I was starting to feel more anger than I was trying to educate people, which wasn't what I wanted to do. I didn't want it to become a podcast of just vitriol and anger. I wanted it to be a podcast for education and understanding, which it wasn't at that point. And it was stagnating to a sense. But then there's the idea of reinvention, that when you can find that motivation again, when you can find that inspiration again, that maybe it's time to do something different. Maybe it's time to change how you're doing it from the get-go. Like, I was feeling pretty stagnant. I didn't feel like the message I wanted to send was being received. But right now, what I'm doing is trying to restart that machine. This is the first step in trying to reignite that fire that I somewhat lost back in February. It's really, really easy to get distracted by the stimulation in life. Like, all I have to do is turn on my computer, open up a web browser, and when I go to a news page, all I see are stories of what is going on in the world. And that's it. That's all it takes, is just looking at the news, and suddenly I am distracted for an entire day. Or there's other stuff. There's fun things that can distract me, like going outside and playing disc golf, which I've started doing more again until I hurt my side. There's entertainment. There's movies. There's Pokemon Go, which I don't play, but I hear is a hoot. There's so many things that can distract us in life. There's social events. I went to a lot of concerts in that period. There's, you know, hanging out with people. There's drinking. There's going to the clubs. There's partying. There's staying home. There's reading. There's doing so many other things that can just kill the motivation for doing something that you once loved. And I felt like I had reached a point where I no longer loved what I was doing with the podcasts. I felt like I was just doing it just to put it out there and it wasn't the message wasn't being received. If I was even sending a message at all, maybe I wasn't. So the key to these distractions essentially is moderation. And not letting those distractions become the primary focus, which is partly what they did. And even though I was able to keep up on my YouTube videos, like my key gripe videos, movie reviews, for the most part, I was just completely enveloped in those distractions, whatever they were. And I'm here now, and I'm asking myself this question, will I return to the form that I had a year ago? Will I return to the mindset that I had when I was basically in my you know in my zone for podcasting when I could pump out podcasts every other week and they would feel like I had done something they felt like they meant something but the reality is, is this is a question we always ask ourselves we're always reinventing ourselves in a sense stagnation is a part of life just as reinvention is stagnation is not always a bad thing sometimes we say we need to decompress you know there was a you know, once upon a time, people would take sabbaticals. They would go for months at a time just to get away from what they were doing 
get away from who they were, just get away. That was the idea of a sabbatical, and we don't always have that. A lot of times we just say, oh, we got to keep, keep turning the wheel is essentially what we're doing. And we all ask ourselves at some point in time, how did I get here? How did I get to this point of stagnation? And how do I get back to where I was passionate about what I was doing? How do I get back to my old form? And sometimes we don't. Sometimes we don't get back. And even with this podcast, I'm not sure I'm going to get back to the same form that I had before. This podcast might be slightly different. You know, I might focus less on talking about politics, more about talking about social issues, or just throw caution to the wind and talk strictly about pop culture. I don't know. It's one of those things that as I look at it and say, what do I want to talk about? What do I want to put out there for the world to digest and think about? It's something that I keep questioning, which is part of the reason why I couldn't come up with an idea for a podcast, why I could not continue to do this. I just didn't know where I wanted to go. I'm starting to feel like I do again. And that's the ebb and flow of motivation. It sometimes comes, it sometimes goes, and you know we have to do what we can to basically capture it when it's here. We have to capture the motivation when we have it so that we're not lost. We don't want to lose ourselves. We don't want to become slaves to our distractions, in a sense. We, we want to find our passions, and if we lose faith that that passion is something that we can continue to do for years or however long we need to, that we can somehow find our way back to it. Because passions, as I've said on this podcast before, passions are so important. It's important to have things that we absolutely love in life. Whether it's, you know, something like this, creating entertainment for people, whether it's hanging out with friends, whether it's wandering around the streets, looking down at your phone, looking for invisible Pokemon, that is certainly something that people can do. But if that's a passion, if that's something that you that drives people, then by God, go and do it. That's exactly what you should be doing. Remember that not all those who wander are lost. We are not always meant to be on one path. The path is going to wander, it's going to meander, it's going to diverge. But whether it comes back to the original path and sets us on a certain trajectory, doesn't really matter because that's our, our life is going to be this wandering path. That's the way life goes. So not all those who wander are lost. That's a great Tolkien quote. Makes for a great t-shirt too. So, so it is one of those things where I do want to get back into this and this is my first step to doing that. But I wonder am I going to be able to do what I did a year ago? And my answer to that is probably no. It probably, I probably will not be able to get back to the same kinds of podcasts that I was doing a year ago. But hopefully, whatever motivation I can find, that I can bring it, I can bring out the best in myself, because that's still the goal. Reinvention is a way of looking inside and saying, what do I need to change to get back to feeling good about what I'm doing. And I feel like I can reinvent myself here. And hopefully you guys can help me. Give me the feedback. If this is not the direction I should be going, let me know. If it is the direction I should be going, then certainly give me a thumbs up or you know, send me a funny joke or a meme or something on Facebook. But just something to know that what I'm doing is actually meaning something. Because I think that's the worst part about what I was doing before. I didn't feel like there was any meaning to it. Like I was saying things, I was giving people information, I was just letting my thoughts out there, but I didn't feel like it was mean, it meant anything. But I know it does. I just have to find that motivation again. I have to get that inspiration again. A lot of times I can find the inspiration in others, in what others do that is amazing and awesome. But I also have to be able to find it in myself first. I have to find that motivation so that I can wander back to the path that I know I should be taking.
Hey guys, thanks again for watching. Um, please check out more of the episodes of Pay With Good Intentions right here on YouTube, or you can check out the audio versions on iTunes and Stitcher. Please also check out my other YouTube shows, which include Key Gripe, Spin Cycle, and more. Um, check out my other podcast, Translation, which can be found at the link below, or on iTunes and or Stitcher. Um, visit me on Twitter at Danny Kessner, or you can find me on Facebook. If you have any questions you'd like me to ponder on the show, send me a message on my webpage, dkessner.com. It's finally up and running, got a contact page and everything. I do want to hear from you and share your unique voice with the world. So once again, this podcast is produced sponsor-free, so thank you for supporting independent artists. I'll see you on the other side.